We good to go? Um, thank you, Andrew. Very informative. Uh, opened my eyes to a lot of the stuff that's going on. I've been a part of different pieces of it over the last several years, but I feel I was caught off guard. I live a block away by one a block away from one of the affected properties. I guess I'm more than 300 feet, so I wasn't notified. I kind of feel cheated, or uh, well, I feel deceived in the process. Uh, knowing that you've gone through the newspaper and such, I haven't noticed these things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm caught off guard by this. So from the presentation, some of the challenges that I think exist are increasing the resident or the, the population by what four to ten percent potentially in one point seven percent of the, the land. I think just kind of the numbers are off. Um, I'm curious why we're not leveraging Alameda Point more in this. Uh, it doesn't make sense while we're kind of forcing it all in certain areas. And uh, I feel that it's really impactful on Park Street. I live a block off Park Street, and you're going to make my neighborhood a parking lot. And uh, I, th I think that the plan could be improved, bring, bring the, the ceiling down from four stories to three stories. I think that you, know, you guys have a good starting point. I think it could still be improved. So I don't think it's a perfect plan yet. I think that there's room to improve. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Thomas to answer the question about Alameda Point. And I also want to make the point that the city is simply identifying sites where housing could be built. We are not responsible for actually building the housing. So if a developer or some other entity comes in and picks a site and says, we want to build housing on this site. That project still has to go through the entire planning process, which will mean you know, more noticed hearings in front of the planning board. Um, there will probably be a CEQA document where we get to talk about the mitigations for traffic. Um, we'll talk about the, the height limits for the buildings, all those kind of things. This simply identifies the sites where it is possible to build housing. Real quick, uh, we did not include Alameda Point in this round because we were very, very nervous that it would not be, quote, available during the planning period. Available under the state of California means it has to be available and zoned for residential use and available to uh, the, the, the market. Um, and we did not want to put that pressure on Alameda Point right now. We don't, it's still under Navy ownership. It's not available. And part of the reason we got the carryover 345 last time is because we promised that Alameda Point would be available by 2006. Um, and it's still not available. So um, it just, once again, it's going to make the next round that much easier um, when Alameda Point is available. But we did not want to make any promises that we could not keep. Because under state law, when you make promises you don't keep, you get penalized. Thank you. Barbara Rasmussen and then Connie Branson. You answered one of my questions about Alameda Point, so, but let me clarify. If we needed to do, what, in the next round, 4,000 houses, we could put all of them on Alameda Point. Is, I mean, is that, I'm just trying to clarify what you're saying is that would that be a correct statement? Uh, in theory, as long as all in there's theory. enough land for all four thousand. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the second question I have is: I understand the overlay process and what you're trying to do here. The question that comes to my mind is: if we allow this exemption, if you will, to Measure A on these properties, what protections are going to be in place? for the person who owns the dump next to my house on Central Avenue who wants to clear that off and put six houses and he says, but wait a minute, you let these guys do it. Uh, let me be very clear. This is why it's important to maintain Measure A. If Measure A gets thrown out by a court, then no. Somebody can walk in and say, hey, I want multifamily housing on my district, on my, on my site. If we preserve Measure A for the rest of the city, what we are saying is somebody walks in, the guy who owns the dump, 
comes in downstairs and says, I want that multifamily overlay zoning district. I can say back to him or her, I'm sorry, our charter doesn't allow multifamily housing. And he will say, well, yeah, but you gave it to the other guy. And we're going to say, yes, we did. But we only gave it, an, we only identified enough sites to meet our state obligation. Once we have our state obligation done, then we can't just willy-nilly go around town and slapping down multifamily zoning because the charter says you can't. Do you understand that? how that okay. works? I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure that I have a high level of confidence in the yeah, follow-through. Well, right. I mean, the, you, the principle is we can't do it unless the state requires us to do it. And the state has sent us a letter saying that's enough. You don't need to do any more. Okay. So that letter is your... Keep it in your hip pocket. Okay. And my my third question actually isn't about housing, but is about traffic. We're talking about bringing in 2,400 housing, 4,000 by the next total by the end of the next round. By my calculations, that's two cars per unit, which means we're talking looking at anywhere from ten eight to ten thousand new vehicles on this island. I'd be interested to know what the traffic plan is for handling all those cars. Because I'm getting a lot of cars in front of my house that I didn't used to get. It's and they're going 40 miles an hour, by the way. Right. But, but Mr. before you go, Mr. Russo? yeah, two things. One is, I think it's important to note that Alameda Point is not a panacea for us because our agreement with the Navy limits us to another 1,425 housing units on Alameda Point. So you can't put 4,000 units on Alameda Point. It won't pencil out. The agreement with the Navy is 1,425 units. So let's be clear about that. The second point is there's a logical flaw in what you just said. If you put up, this, if you approve the staff's recommendation, you don't get 4,000 units. If you do staff's recommendation, you get 2,400. And the other point is every one of those projects has to go through the CEQA process, the planning board process, deal with traffic mitigations, deal with height limitations, and all of the other density issues. Those aren't circumvented by identifying these sites in this document at this time. So the traffic issues still have to be noticed, heard. You go through the entire process like you would in anything else. Maybe I was confused. I thought it was 2,400 the first round, and in the second certification, it was another 1,700. No. That's only no. if we don't pass. Only if we don't pass. And we're penalized. Yeah. So, so right now, it's looking like 2,400 this round. This is remember, this is just identifying sites. If we pass this, it's looking like our numbers the next round are 1,700. But we will have already identified sites for 2,400 housing units, so next round we'll be done. We don't have to identify anything new. Right. If Thank we pass you. it. We don't if we pass, pass it, if we don't pass it, then they add, and that's where you get to the 4,000. Thank you. Okay. Marie, before you get too far into the dialogue, could you explain where the initial numbers come from? Okay. Everyone's saying you need 2,400. Okay. That's what you're striking for. Why are where does that number come from for information for the community? Andrew, what I'd like you to do is put the slide back up again, explain it, explain it a second time, because it's a state-generated number. It's not a bag. Okay, the way this works, the state of California, every round, identifies how much housing the state of California needs total. Then what they do is they divide that number. This happens in Sacramento without any discussion from us. Um, they send to each region, they give a portion of the big California number. So then ABAG, this is where ABAG kicks in. ABAG has Excuse the, me, Andrew, can you tell everybody what ABAG stands <laughs> oh, okay. for? Right. Association of Bay Area Governments. That's our regional governing structure for the Bay Area. It's, we refer to it as ABAG. So those poor people get every seven years a big fat number, which is the total number of housing units that the whole region, the Bay Area, needs to accommodate in the next round. And their job is to work with all the cities to allocate the big Bay Area number among the various cities. And the way they do that is they try to come up with 
uh, they try to not just make it a big political football because what happens is people like me come storming down to their offices and say, we can't accommodate any more housing because we're no different than every other city, Pleasant and the rest. Everybody's concerned about traffic and all those things. So all staff people like me go storming down there and say, we can't accommodate any more housing. And they come up with formulas for how to distribute. And it's typically um, very complicated, but they, they try to take in regional policies such as reducing greenhouse gases, preserving farmland. So what happens is the inner Bay Area cities like Alameda, Oakland, San Francisco, and more recently they've been using criteria about uh, access to transit, um, and BART in particular, which is one reason why at the next round our number actually went down. San Francisco and Oakland's went way up. Um, so we then get, after a lot of meetings and discussions, we ultimately get our number, which in this case was for this round, 2,000 and it's just over 2,000, 2,100 or just under 2,100. That was what ABAG gave us. We wrote our housing element for that number and the state sent us that letter, 2009 letter, and said, yeah, but you failed under state law on the last round, so you have this penalty, which is how we added the 374 I, on top of the okay. 2,000. Give a little bit more explanation, okay? Appreciate that. Yeah. Give a little bit more explanation where we have been in the past, because we went forward and says just because of our geographic area, our constraints, that we should not be held to that level. Has our hearings ever been successful in doing that? You know, every city makes the same case. We have constraints. Well, um, our, you know, Pleasanton is a lot different than Alameda in that respect for access. Well, they don't think so. Um, well, that's the problem. And Hang on, Councilman I Johnson. I, it's my recollection that um, in maybe 2006 or so, we did appeal our, we, at that one point we did appeal our ABAG number. We won at the ABAG level, but then we lost at the HCD level. So um, we, lo we ultimately lost. Um, I guess. And, and HCD, for those of you following along at home, <laughs> is the state level. That's, and, okay. here's, and here's the problem. Have we challenged so, that level at this point in time? Uh, not, not since 2006. And, and here's the problem that, and why these challenges are very, very difficult is um, ABAG is they could, if they take the housing units away from Alameda and say, okay, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll take 100 off. They've got to find some other city to accept it. So um, the state requirement to, for, a, for the Association of Bay Area Governments is you have to allocate all of these. You don't get to come back to the state and say it's too much. The state decides the total number for the region. And we were never successful in? I've in never, not while I've been here. And I've been here since 2002. Who sits on our ABA? I do. Okay. Connie Branson and then Lola Brown. I agree with a lot of what Mrs. Rasmussen said, and I'm concerned about the traffic also. I also have other concerns. One is when you talk about Alameda, Alameda is different because Alameda is an island, and we can only spread out so far. And if we're not going to bring into the equation the point, then this limits what land we do have. And then I'm also concerned when you talk about putting in all this housing, and I can understand people wanting to live in Alameda, but I think something also needs to be considered, and that is the recreational area. Where are we going to have more parks, more play areas for the community? I think that needs to be considered. And the other thing is I'm also concerned about this talk about our need for housing in California when on the news, it's constantly talking about how many houses are in foreclosure and all these empty areas. It seems like we ought to consider those kinds of places and, and work on helping people get into homes that are already built in California. Thank you. Lola Brown and then Ken Peterson. Hi there. I sent a letter to all of you as an individual. Um, we live on Fernside Boulevard, and I'm going to tell you right now that if there is ever an emergency, I'm the first one off the island. We live near High Street, and we'll get off the bridge. I'm really concerned about that. If we continue to build out 
where are we going to put people as far as infrastructure, as far as uh, schools, as far as the recreation and park department's use of the land here? And how are we going to accommodate those people on the streets and getting off the island? You know what happened at Bay Farm. If, if there had been that wonderful land swap out there, those people would have been stuck in an emergency. We are in the same position here. So, and I know that there's a lot of people here tonight to speak about other issues, but I'm really concerned that we listen to the citizens, the people that voted you in and the people that really care about the city. Please, please listen to them and really consider this. I understand the state's requirements, but this is an island and we have to be able to address that and tell them. Thank you. Ken Peterson, thank you. Ken Peterson and then Dorothy Freeman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, wonderful presentation, uh, very impressive, very complicated, uh, I, I mean very difficult, and you'll be tired this evening. Uh, and thank you. Uh, the things that will happen because of the housing uh, increase, of course, are pretty obvious, and they're, they're not pleasant for the city. The issues that many people have are now not issues uh, for the council. Unfortunately, it's out of your hands. Uh, they're issues for the state and they've been going a long time. Originally, uh, the law, I think the housing element law, goes back to 1980, and we've been working along on this for all these years. Uh, the SB 375 is an environmental issue that brought uh, the housing element, transportation, uh, in environment, and some other uh, issues all together under a greenhouse gas reduction and uh, global warming uh, uh, protection uh, measure in which that is the principle. Uh, the, the question I think is not that uh, whether we have to uh, comply with state law, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that, that we have to do that. Uh, uh, you know, Pleasanton had an experience, other cities have experience, and they don't work, come out very well. The thing that I see, though, is that there are many alternatives or possibilities that are offered within the law, existing law. Uh, SB 375 is an environmental issue, and it offers a lot of, uh, a lot of possibilities for communities like ourselves uh, to mitigate the, uh, the requirements. Uh, and, and we haven't pursued them as far as I know. That's a rebuttable presumption. Mr. Thomas can correct those things. Uh, and in fact, the law actually says that the cities and the areas uh, can pursue these. Now, I want to point out another thing as, as to the zoning. Once the zoning is established, if I read the law correctly, uh, then with the developments, the city does not have the full range of, of uh, administrative uh, and policy uh, procedures that would ordinarily exist. The law specifically says that the CEQA does not apply in some of these cases, and there are, any, there are some other uh, omissions from the normal procedures. So, no, it doesn't go along the same way as all of the other ordinary procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Dorothy Freeman and then Mary Anderson. Good evening, Council and Citizens Alameda. Boatworks is an approved high-density housing development along the estuary at Oak and Clement. The environmental impact report of Boatwork states the addition of project generated traffic would cause loss of service, LOS, at the si signalized intersection of Park Street and Blanding Avenue to degrade from LOSE to LOSF during the AM peak hour and from LOSD to LOSE during the PM peak hour. The problem is also stated as significant and unavoidable. The EIR also states that it is calculated that only 10% of the new residents will use alternative modes of transit during the peak hours. This is with the addition of only approximately 180 units. What are you going to do with more than 2,000 new units? You are going to submit the population of the entire island to a substandard quality of life. Adding 2,000 new homes to the north side will not only affect those of us who live right in the middle of it, but every person on this island who drives a car or rides a bus across one of the north side bridges or through the two. In the Tri-Valley, when they added new subdivisions, they added new lanes to the freeway and another BART station. For increased traffic to Walnut Creek, they're adding a new tunnel. 
The Boat Works EIR said the only thing that could be done to solve the, our traffic problem was to add a new lane to the Park Street Bridge, but that was not, would not be an option. Adding so much additional traffic to the island will cause the rest of us to live a substandard quality of life as it becomes impossible to get on or off the island, especially during the a.m. or p.m. commute times or during a disaster. Just getting around the island has already become more difficult. The state of California does not have the right to dictate a substandard way of life to us without offering mitigation to the problems their regulations will cause us. We need a new bridge or a new tube. If the state can give alternatives to other communities, why not to Alameda? Thank you. Thank you. Mary Anderson and then Ashley Jones. Good evening. After Mr. Thomas's presentation, showing us all the ways that this issue was presented to the public, you're probably wondering, as I am, why it took so many of us by surprise. Well, I think one thing that I could suggest is that you make the language as clear and simple and understandable as possible. For example, reading the agenda for tonight, an ordinary layman reading this paragraph, amending various sections of the Alameda Municipal Code contained in Chapter 30, Development Regulations, to ensure consistency between the State Housing Element Law, the City of Alameda General Plan, and the City of Alameda Municipal Code. Wow, wouldn't it be easy just to slide right over that? and think to yourself, oh, they're correcting some terminology in the law there. Uh, the, the lawyers are cleaning it up a little bit. And that kind of thing happens all the time. Why would I be concerned? And suppose some of those public notices in the paper, instead of being worded as they were, and looking very official and boring and busy people don't want to take time for it, because, of course, we have Measure A to protect us, and we slide over those. But suppose there's a headline saying, Measure A knocked out by state law. Then people could understand that. Then they would understand this is an issue that's going to affect us. Now you might say, well, that's inflammatory. Well, darn right it's inflammatory. And shouldn't it be? Because you have to get the public's attention. You don't want to go through all these months and months of preparatory work and then have such a major segment of your population taken by surprise. And they don't understand the issues because they haven't been paying attention. And having that key meeting on July 3rd, come on, what are people doing on July 3rd? So I'm saying I can understand that Mr. Thomas feels offended because he's tried very hard to make all of this public. But I think if he wants further suggestions about how to get the public's attention, I would be glad to help him. Thank you. Okay. My, Thank you. Please, please, we have a lot of speakers. My second issue concerns the Charter. I hold our Charter in great respect, and I am very concerned about how we proceed with this. Set aside all of these other issues about the housing and so on, how does this affect our charter and the preservation of Measure A? Since, as I understand it, it Wrap up quickly. it's the voters that can change the charter, should there be a measure on the ballot that is carefully designed to modify the wording of Measure A to still give us maximum protection possible and comply with the law? I, I want us to try to deal with protecting respect and the sacredness of the Charter. Thank you. And you ask a very good question, so I'm going to turn this over to the City Attorney to talk about the interplay between the Charter and state law. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the way it works in the democracy that we live in is the power is from the people is given to the government, and the government has a hierarchy, as you all know. Uh, there's the federal government, the state, and then the local levels. And that's how the, the, the power is, um, the, the guy on the top has the most power, let's put it that way. In California, um, there are charter cities as opposed to general law cities. 
General law cities are created pursuant to state statute and can only do what the, the legislature has authorized them to do, primarily found in the government code. Charter cities have the ability to have more power, more power to the people, so the people can adopt a charter, and the state, the state constitution allows for that as long as the matters that are in the charter are those of municipal interest. If they are of statewide interest, then the state preempts the charter or the people in the local government to be able to take action. It's the same thing with states wanting to do something that is in the purview of the federal government, like the Commerce Clause, which you've all heard about. A state can't, can't uh, prohibit certain, certain transfers or, or travel of people because that is deemed to be a federal uh, issue or defending the gov defending the the, um, the United States is a is the federal government not the state's responsibility so with the charter we as long as it's a municipal affair we have the right and this this city has exercised it uh, to to have certain certain provisions put in their charter and that's how measure a came about however in the instance that Andrew Thomas has been describing to you on the housing element, the state has stepped in and has said, no, the need to provide housing is of statewide concern, not local municipal concern, and therefore the state directs what we have to do. And what we have been very, very, uh, trying very hard to accomplish is to protect as much of the interpretation of Measure A as we can while still conforming with the requirements of state law, which we have no choice but to conform with. And that's why we are doing this overlay, but not, not hopefully risking losing all of Measure A's provisions. This happened with the density bonus. We had to pass an ordinance because that was a statewide concern. So we passed the density, the density bonus ordinance and still maintained Measure A. One more time, we're going to have to take an action like that, or we're going, it, because if someone would challenge us, frankly, we would, we would probably have Measure A found unconstitutional if it doesn't allow us to comply with state law. Thank you. Ashley Jones and then Lester Cabral. Good evening, uh, I'm Ashley Jones, and uh, I must say that after tonight's uh, presentation, I feel like uh, there's nowhere to go because the people who are supporting this change and all that's going on are the same people who supported SunCal and supported Measure C, and they're waiting in the wings to snap up and ruin the city. There's a difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And the spirit of the law is, I don't think, going to be followed by the people who are in charge of um, looking out for the people of Alameda. Um, in some way, we're kind of at the mercy of the city council and the city manager, and so I feel sorry for us. Lester Cabral and Gail DeHaan. Uh, good evening. Um, I think the main issue with this new new ordinance would be uh, values. Uh, what's going to happen to property values here in Alameda? If they build next to you, you know your values are going to go down. Um, the other thing I see here mainly is is under it's under item K, affordable housing requirements. Um, there's some pretty tough stuff in here. Um, a 60% increase in maximum allowable density that would put it at 48 units, um, uh, a requirement no more than 75 feet of open space per unit, pretty small, uh, one parking space uh, per affordable resident unit. I don't think that's going to make it. Um, it's just too many. I think there's some items in here that uh, need to be readdressed. And I suggest tonight that you take a no vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gail DeHaan and then Alexander Stevens. 
Um, this is a very, it's going to have a very serious impact on this city. And um, SunCal had a very serious impact on this city. And we are currently in uh, litigation with them as we speak. Uh, please bear with me because some of us are visual. Think of this as the tube as the city of Alameda. Only so much uh, fits in and only so much comes out. This tube states clearly what's inside, unlike the ordinance you're voting for tonight. We know that we don't have to use this to clean our teeth. There's other alternatives. We also know there are other alternatives to meet the state requirements, and there is no big rush. Slow down. Let the people have input to this enormous project. And 300 feet is maybe what state law requires, but it's really not appropriate for all the people that live around all of these sites. Think of this tube as the naysayers, as some council members like to refer to the 85% of the people who voted no on SunCal. We knew what kind of impact SunCal was going to have on this city. Now we face this and SunCal's. Uh, we know what SunCal was going to have, but we're yet to know what we're expected to do there. We uh, voted no on the cow and long, uh, land swap along with other issues. And remember, we like to keep things clean. And similar to dental x-rays, we like to keep things transparent to avoid decay in our precious city. Okay, now think of this as our city budget. Oops, we can't balance it. Remember, it only holds so much, and you can only squeeze so much out of it. Think of this budget tube tonight when you vote to give almost $2 million to the firefighters for more equipment. But then maybe you might also think of recusing yourself from the vote. Now think of this tube as the Webster Street tube. You can't squeeze the traffic in and you can only squeeze so much traffic out. Mr. Russo, was, when he was running for legislature, he promised the city of Alameda a new tube. What are we going to do with additional 4,000 cars because of this ordinance? And that's not counting the development of Alameda Point. They want to take away one of the um, lane, the car lanes and use it for buses. One more sentence, That's, please. You know what? It's not, it's, earth, it's not earthquake proof. What are we going to do then? Thank you. Alexander Stevens and Jim, then Jim Smallman. I'm Alex Stevens. I heard tonight how long you've been working on this project. And I think you work in a vacuum because you, you didn't think of anything about what the population is going to think about traffic, city services, emergencies. You didn't address that at all. And I think that's your responsibility. And I think you failed a lot. And I really, I mean, you, how many years have you been working on this? Excuse thing? me, Madam Mayor. Would please. you please so, ask the speaker to address the body and not address the staff member? Okay. I've said what I've said was said. And I'm going to say one more time that this is about identifying sites where housing can be placed. The mitigations, whether it's for traffic, park services, or whatever other mitigations we might be talking about, do not come forward until there's an actual project being proposed. This is the identification of sites where housing could be built. The city is not required to build any of that housing. Jim Smallman and then Helen Soss. Thank you. I, I do have some questions and, and the critical one for me is why there are, uh, and I have several communications from, from members here that says every city must have a housing element that includes 
multifamily dwellings. I just moved uh, two years ago from Villa Park, California, where no multifamily, and that's, that's a, a city in Southern California. It's not part of ABAG or the Northern California structure, but I know no multifamily dwellings were allowed there. So why is there some exceptions, and how do we qualify for that? I don't think Hillsboro allows multiple family dwellings. Um, I don't think, in fact, I tried to buy a house in, or looked at a house in Hillsboro and was told uh, no multifamily dwellings were allowed in Hillsboro. Piedmont, I don't believe, has multifamily. So how do we, how do we reconcile, <clears throat> reconcile the claim that uh, every city is required to have this element when uh, I know personally that, that at least two don't? So that's one question I have. And, and then a follow-on to that is, is it because we're a member of ABAG? And does that tie our hands? And if it does, uh, how do we untie our hands? And the last uh, point that I'd like to, to point to, to, to uh, make is this is really a precedent. And, and your own wording in the, in the um, uh, in the uh, council uh, ordinance, it says this establishes appropriate processes and procedures for the review of future residential development proposals and ensures equal pr access to all income groups and household types. So we're not talking about just this seven-year period. We had a requirement in the last seven-year period. We had a requirement in this seven-year period, and seven-year periods sound to me like they go on forever. So how do we guarantee or assure ourselves that next seven-year period we don't have another 4,000 or another 2,400 or another 2,000 or something? How do we get out of this cycle? I was here in 73, as many people in this room were, when Measure A was passed. And two of the buildings that, that are in your uh, little, little uh, slideshow um, Mr. Thomas, uh, we're in a block that I owned property, 2242 and 2246 San Antonio. It's right down please, the street from please that. Please finish up. We have a lot of speakers. And the parking was impossible then, and it still is. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I reiterate? It, it is, it's not, we need the speakers to address the body not address individual staff members. It's not appropriate. Thank you. Helen Sauce and then Diane Lichtenstein. Mayor, council members, thank those of you who so tirelessly work for the good of the city. This is an exciting opportunity for the city. The adopted housing element will provide a roadmap and controls for development the development that will inevitably occur in the next few years, these controls will enable the city to direct that development rather than submit to a piecemeal approach that will otherwise occur and lose out on many of the state funding programs. It will certainly be detrimental to our quality of life that we enjoy in Alameda. I came here in 1964, and so I've seen a few changes. As Mr. Thomas noted, some time ago the state law that was enacted to override local prohibitions on density, this change affected all cities. And uh, I was just sitting near a fellow board member who is from Palo Alto, and he was busily trying to draft a housing element that would be accepted for the city of Palo Alto. Now. Alameda's carefully crafted housing element and accompanying zoning controls will direct how that change in state law affects us. I really compliment staff, the planning board, and council for consideration of all opinions and viewpoints. Staff has been really careful over these years to discuss the draft with citywide groups and organizations. And as Mr. Thomas demonstrated, there have been exhaustive notices 
of meetings on the plan and articles and letters in the local papers opining on the impact. The state approval of our housing element will have a huge beneficial impact on Alameda beyond controlling development. The eligibility for programs including transportation grants and similar fun funding opportunities are even now more desperately needed with redevelopment tool no longer available. It also, as has been pointed out, protects our vulnerability to lawsuits that nearby cities have suffered. We have an opportunity to achieve an approved housing element for the city's general plan that includes the actions taken at the last council meeting. The companion zoning addendum before the council tonight is a pivotal moment for our city and does so at no risk because the element simply identifies and guides inevitable development, but the city retains all normal planning controls, mitigations for traffic, and environmental analysis. Homes, the Homes Organization, urge you to approve the zoning addendum before you tonight. This will Please complete the forward-looking plan to be submitted to the state and keeps Alameda in control of its future. Thank you. Thank you, Diane Lichtenstein, and then, oh, Doug Biggs. Good evening. You know, I think that some of the concerns that have been uh, expressed tonight are, are valid. However, as we've heard, to me, the question is moot because it's totally out of the city's hands, as Andrews has so eloquently and passionately tried to explain to us. Uh, I think that this housing element includes the opportunity to build a large variety of residences in Alameda. It can only be to the value to the city. But it is a state law, and if we don't like the state law, then I think we need to try and change it at the state level. But we certainly cannot change it here, and it seems to me the consequences, as pointed out, are just more than we ever uh, want to undergo. And again, some of the uh, concerns that people have voiced uh, may be valid and, and perhaps can be, as time goes on, can be used within the city. But right now, uh, it, it is moot and nothing to discuss uh, that, the, that the city council can do. I believe that it will only be, as I say, of great value to our city and the variety of housing and the housing costs will bring a diversity of population that can be an asset to us. And I very much first con commend the staff for their incredibly hard work over a long period of time and urge the city council to vote in favor of this housing element. Thank you. Doug Biggs and then Catherine Manalo. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the city council. My name is Doug Biggs. I'm with the Alameda Point Collaborative. Um, and I want to thank you, thank the planning board and staff for all of the hard work that's been put into bringing this housing element this far forward. Um, we are an island, but we're not an island nation. And last I checked, we're still subject to the laws of the state of California. And a lot of the discussion has been held tonight about why we need to do this, because it's the state law. But I want to point out why we just need to do it, because it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, a lot of the concerns that have been brought up tonight about saving Major A, about getting parklands, about getting transportation, this will allow us to do this. This will allow us to control our destiny. This is going to preserve Major A for the bulk of the island. This will open up opportunity for funding, for transportation, and most importantly for parkland. Last year a million dollar grant came out for parks for low income areas. It could have been used to design and move forward the Gene Sweeney Beltway. It could have been used to incorporate green spaces into a development at Island High School. We weren't allowed to apply for that because we didn't have a housing element. It would have been the right thing to do to access some of those funds. That's why we need to move forward at this time. And I just want to thank you very much for your leadership on this process. Thank you. Catherine Manalo and then Darren Lowndes. Hi, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Council members, you don't see me very often here. I have a, a disabled um, young adult at home who requires a lot of care, and an older young adult son still living at home in our basement who would really like to move out at age 26. <laughs> um, 
I have a really long history. Both of my grandfather and my father were clergy people on the island, uh, one at the Court Street Methodist Church and one at the old Santa Clara Methodist Church. When my husband and I um, wanted to relocate after moving away from the Bay Area, we chose Alameda because we really like Alameda. I have a lot of friends here on the other side, and I'm a little nervous, frankly, about expressing my, my opinion because there are so many people here who care so deeply, as I do, about the city of Alameda, about the quality of our housing, about the quality of life here. I have concerns about traffic, too. I have many of the same concerns. But I think that we live in a society that's a connected kind of system. You know, we're the federal government, a state government, and municipal government, and we're connected to the state. and. You know, there's a great need right now. There's a great need for housing. And, and I sort of feel like maybe we haven't been doing our part. A lot of people have said to me that, you know, a number of people that if we just approve basements, you know, in Victorians as, as houses that, you know, as housing for low income people, that that would solve our problem. But I don't think so. Um, I know that this doesn't actually approve any housing, um, itself and that everything has to go through the, the process, um, I'm grateful for that. Um, I know that in these times of great economic struggle, I think that, uh, you know, we have to be concerned. I know there's a lot of concern about housing values, but I guess I was raised to think that there was more to be concerned about than our housing values. And I agree with the former speaker that it's kind of the right thing to do, former speakers, to provide a variety of housing that can take care of people who are somewhat less fortunate or people who become less fortunate, who get foreclosed on in the process. Um, I'd like to thank the staff. And uh, it was really informative to hear your presentation. And I'd also really like to thank the City Council and the Planning Board for the extensive process that folks have gone through. Um, I just, I'm really excited to see that there is this multi-family zoning overlay that will allow the consideration of construction of affordable housing. So I just want to thank you all so very much. Thank you. Darren Lowndes and then Corinne Lambden. Good evening and thank you Mayor Gilmore and City Council members. Uh, I've made public comment on this item at both the Planning Board and the July 3rd City Council meetings, so I'll keep my, tonight's comments brief. Uh, my name is Darren Lowndes, Executive Director of HCB and Board President of East Bay Housing Organizations. I'd like to sincerely thank City staff, the Planning Board, and the City Council for their support of the housing element and the multifamily overlay. The overlay is a good balance between civic process and the housing needs of Alameda citizens. The overlay is a positive change in zoning, allowing smart development in Alameda, and the multifamily overlay still provides the city all of its normal planning controls, including mitigations for traffic, parking, and environmental reviews, as mentioned previously. The multifamily overlay will also make it possible over time for Alameda's lower income seniors, families, and people with disabilities to have quality, affordable homes here in the city that they love. Thank you for your time, your efforts, and I urge you to vote yes tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Corinne Lambden and then Darcy Morrison. Good evening, Council. Um, my sense is, after listening to many of the speakers tonight, that many, many people in this room and listening would feel a lot more comfortable about the proposed ordinance if we had some greater understanding about controls for the future. Uh, the way I look at it right now, there are no controls for misuse of this ordinance in the future. Um, I do understand from Mr. Thomas that any future um, proposals would have to come up before the Planning Board and the City Council for approval, but unless there is some language in there that says that this would only occur at the, at the insistence of the state um, and ABAG requirements, then what's to stop uh, some future council or the planning board in the future or some 
future development putting it forward a proposal if there's no language in the ordinance to prevent it? Um, personally, I take the position that ABAG's fair share allocation program is inherently unfair to cities that have real constraints such as egress and access and available land sufficiently high above projected sea levels. The fair share allocation program needs to be revised to spread responsibility around all Bay Area communities with special consideration for those like Alameda that have particular restraints. Why are those cities that already have a high proportion of rental and low income housing expected to add as many low income units as similar sized communities that have a relatively small percentage of low income housing? I would also like to note that Oakland Chinatown has a valid concern that traffic entering and leaving Alameda impacts their quality of life. I cannot imagine them sitting patiently and placidly if Alameda goes ahead with plans to build upwards of 2,400 new homes. Um, a previous speaker, and possibly Mr. Thomas, mentioned the concern about uh, lawsuits, but I think we're all very aware that there's a big lawsuit there sitting waiting for us too. Um, my last concern is about the proposed five-story height limit. Why do we need to raise the height limit to five stories? As Mr. Po Thomas pointed out in his slide presentation, there are several buildings around Alameda that achieve this high density with two or three stories. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy Morrison and then John Spangler. I spoke at the last council meeting and I'm speaking again tonight to raise the same issues. First and foremost, you need to delay passage of, of this ordinance until the public has had a further opportunity to review it. I understand that this process has been underway for several years, and my thought is that a couple more months don't matter. This de deci decision should be carried over to a date following the council recess. To claim that Measure A is exclusionary is either naive or cynical. Alameda is an island with tremendous traffic constraints and tremendous development pressure. Developers come here and they see dollar signs. Without Measure A, we would have a wall of condos along the waterfront and a city rendered virtually unlivable by massive traffic jams. Alameda, Alameda remains livable pre precisely because of Measure A. I think we need to spell out precisely how and when the multi-unit zoning overlay will be applied. The voting public needs an assurance that it will not be necessary to go to court to restrict the use of the zoning overlay to the stated purpose. If the purpose is to meet a bag housing allotments, then the ordinance needs to make that clear, and it does not. We need a public process also spelled out to decide where each application of the zoning overlay will be made. The need for compliance with state law should not be an excuse to throw together an ordinance and then demand that the public accept it. So in sum, all of this needs to be spelled out. In all cases, I want to reiterate that verbal assurances are not sufficient. Either the voting public is given adequate control over the process or the voting public will oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. John Spangler and then Gretchen Lippo. Thank you, Mayor Gilmore, members of the council and staff. And thank you to, especially to Andrew and the other staff who have worked on this for a long time. Andrew spent a long time talking to me about this over the last several years. The housing element has been out of compliance with state law for most of the time I've lived in Alameda. We moved here in 1997. So this is not news. Nobody had to wake me up and ask me to read the newspaper to say housing is a problem in this town. It was obvious every time I skimmed the paper, and there are two to read each week, just to know what's going on in this town. And I don't think the city is responsible for waking people up and waving a red flag. Uh, Ms. Henderson mentioned a lot of things about that being an issue. She had no problem figuring out what happened at Target when Target was trying to move into South Shore. Uh, I support this movement, this element. I think it's too conservative. I think we would be greener if we had, and we'd have better transportation and less congestion with higher density than this ordinance and these zoning levels recommend. 
but I support it compared to the options that exist if we don't accept it and become compliant with state law. This is a minimal requirement in terms of any perceived sacrifice, and I don't see any sacrifices here. Uh, apartment buildings are not a foreign alien invader to Alameda. Everybody knows they exist here. We've lived with them for decades, century, almost over a century. So uh, there's no surprise here. Um, if you want to have traffic congestion, keep building single-family homes that are Measure A compliant and that have 2.5 or 3.5 cars per house as opposed to building high-density multifamily housing where you have people being encouraged to take transit because transit agencies can provide more service more economically to higher-density developments. There are controls in this, evidence, this ordinance contrary to a claim that was recently made at this podium. They're all plainly available to anybody who's witnessed the planning board meeting. So I support this, and um, this does offer minimal encouragement and facilitation for the multifamily housing that we need. I do support the comments made by Doug Biggs in particular, but also Diane Lichtenstein and Helen South and other supporters of this ordinance. Thank you very much for your hard work, and thank you for adopting it. Thank you. Gretchen Lippo and then Denny Adenaya. Um, before I start, I wanted to enter into the record um, the census data showing the tremendous diversity that has occurred in Alameda since the passage of Measure A. There are those who make the claims that Measure A was a racist char charter amendment, and the facts do not bear up to this at all. There's no evidence to support this. In fact, from the time when Measure A was passed, non-white citizens were only 7.1% of the population, and today this figure is 42%, representing an increase of 35%. This is an amazing number to consider, and the only other dramatic change in the demographics of this city is that the white population went from 90% in 1970 to 50% in, the, in 2010. I also want to point out another comparison, that of our density. We are, the number of people per square mile today in Alameda density is virtually the same as Oakland. Um, finally, there are a lot of us here who support Measure A and support affordable housing. And the reason why I'm having an objection to this is I want to understand more about the kind of affordable housing that you have in mind, because I know affordable housing comes in different layers. And I also know that when you have affordable housing, you have to provide a safety net for the people who live in this affordable housing. Remember um, the Buena Vista apartments in 2004 when 650 people were evacuated, mass evacuation? Where was the state then? That was your largest minority population group in the city. And what about the henderson guyton suit in 1989 that said the city should come in with some um, affordable housing with 320 spots? And I think we've, we've gotten up to, what, 150 or something? But I didn't see anybody coming down on that. I kept waiting for that to happen. So what I'm saying is I think in order to get people on your side, in order to be real, I mean, 250. 40, I mean, give me a break. 2,400 units? It's not going to happen. Not now, not in this economy, maybe some parts of it. But that's what we ought to look at, are the parts, the details. What's, where's a good place to start? Let's explain to people what affordable housing really means and what it costs and how much burden the city's going to have to carry. You've got to have schools. Those are bonds or parcels. That's not, that doesn't come with the, um, with the territory. So I think there's a lot of extenuating circumstances and issues and facts that we need to get under our belts before we jump too far. Thank you. Thank you. Denny Adenaya and then Joy Chin Mallory. Hello, good evening. Um, first, I'd like to say that uh, my family and I live on Briggs Avenue. We don't live within 300 feet of any of the notified site, parcels that were notified residents within 300 feet. Yet I've been, we've been following this issue for years, and so I have spoken before this body before. I'll keep my comments short. 
Um, I'm here to convey my full support of the amendments to the housing element in particular. I fully support the proposal for the multifamily housing overlay. Um, Alameda is in dire need of more diverse residential options beyond single family homes to house a diverse range of Alamedans. That includes singles, couples, single parent households, adults with disabilities, seniors, as well as families. Um, I support the proposal tonight not because it is state law, but because the multifamily housing overlay is a rational and it is a minimal way of complying with state law. Thank you. Thank you. Joy Chin Mallory and then Laura Thomas. I agree with the last speaker. Um, I live in Alameda. I've lived here for a long time. And I own one of those dumps that I would like to fix up. And my whole family, as the neighbors think my whole family, one of my sons and his family lives with me. And there's a lot of objection because there's a lot of people in this one house. I would like them to move and I'd like them to stay here and I'd like them to have their children go to school here and I'd like them to be able to afford housing. But aside from my family, it is the right thing to do, to provide housing for people who need to be here, who have their families here, their jobs here, their jobs in the area. We all can't move to foreclosed homes in other areas. We just can't pack up and leave. So I thank you all for your very hard work on this housing element. And I want to see Alameda move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Thomas and then Don Latin. Uh, let's see. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, and staff. My name is Laura Thomas, President of Renewed Hope Housing Advocates, and you've heard from us plenty. So you know how we stand, how much we support this, how, much, how hard we work to, to get it to this point. I'm here to urge you to vote on the second reading of the zoning ordinance that will fully implement this long-awaited housing element for the city. It has certainly not been rushed through, especially since it's five years overdue. The Victorians that give Alameda part of its character have been preserved. I don't think we have to worry about them anymore. I know it was a good idea when Measure A was passed. Um, the traffic issue is a bit of a red herring in that what we want, we want to attract new industry to this town, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the like. And if we don't provide housing, there will be more traffic. That's guaranteed. The issue of automobile travel is something we must all confront. Um, as to our personal driving habits and as a community by developing transit alternatives, but not by putting it on the back some new residents, young workers, and seniors looking to downsize, looking for decent, affordable housing. In the end, Madam Mayor, as you said, before casting your vote on July 3rd, it's a matter of the city's values. And those values require passing this ordinance tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Don Latin and then Amy Fishman. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. This is the first time I've been to a city council meeting and addressed the council. Um, I live on Buena Vista Avenue, very near to one of the sites identified for possible affordable housing, the Chipman uh, Storage Warehouse. And I think that would, if, if, if affordable housing was built there, I think that would be a great addition, a benefit to my neighborhood. Um, I, I, this is not so much a question for members of the council, but for, for people who look at this Measure A like it's holy scripture or something that can never be challenged. I mean, where are people supposed to live? Where are people who teach our children in the schools, who wait on our tables? Where are, where are low and moderate income people supposed to live in this town? And I also think traffic is a red herring. If people have jobs here, and they live here, that will cut down on the number of people going through our tube and over our bridges. So I encourage the council to adopt this housing element, not because it's the, they're required to do it by law, but because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Amy Fishman and then Jean O. Oh. 
Good evening, members of council and members of the public. Thank you very much uh, for listening to my comments tonight. Uh, East Bay, I'm with East Bay Housing Organizations. We are throughout Alameda and Contra Costa County. And let me promise you that communities throughout the area are having these very hard conversations, deep conversations, talking about what are the moral values of our community, who is our community, and who are we here for, and what does our community, what is it going to look like in the years to come? So you are not alone, Alameda. You are among many wonderful communities in the area that are struggling with these issues. And what I want to say is that what is the core of this is how can every community be fair? How can every community be inclusive? How can every community be equitable? How can every community be sustainable? How can we all be thoughtful to our neighbors? How can we meet the needs of communities? How can we, especially in hard times, bring compassion and conscientiousness to our decision making and how do we open our hearts and our minds to listen to each other. And I've listened really carefully to everyone here tonight. I took a lot of notes. I really want to think about people's fears, people's concerns, people's questions and address them. And I want to acknowledge and congratulate the deep hard work that this community has gone through led by your planning board, your staff and yourselves and your public to really try and dig into this. There are not going to be any easy answers. but it's about how we hold on to our values. It's about where are returning veterans going to live in our communities. People already talked about teachers. How about young families? How about our elders? And what is it that communities need to thrive and be strong and people who live here so they can invest in the local community? And I also do want to echo that we know that people who live in homes that are affordable have lower rates of cars and driving than people who live in upscale housing. So East Bay Housing Organizations, we're happy to help work with this community to provide continued to support. We can give tours. We can show you examples throughout Alameda and throughout the area of beautiful, wonderful, thriving, vibrant communities. These are communities that have rich with services. They have computer centers and after school programs and really great places for kids to grow up and really great places for our seniors to uh, grow old and stay in place. Uh, we're talking about creating a whole community where you have good planning, great housing, strong, diverse, whole, multiracial, multi-ethnic communities. So in the spirit of inclusion and looking to the future, this is the right thing to do. Congratulations and thank you. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Jean O. and then Carol Gutstein. Hello, council members. I come here as a uh, retailer, a resident, as well as a board member of uh, Alameda local nonprofits. Now, I echo a lot of the concerns that my opponents have here. Um, I am fully opposed to the way you guys handled Measure C, the way you guys ha handled SunCal, uh, the way you guys handled this whole land swap deal around Cowan. So I fully understand the opponents and, and what we're talking about here. But I got to say that I'm fully in support of this housing um, plan you guys are, are doing here. Now, we're only hopping and skip away from Stockton, the largest city in the United States that filed for bankruptcy. For those of you who think that we're not anything like Stockton, well, look at it. Five years ago, they were bustling. They borrowed tens of millions of dollars to try to improve their civic center, much like we did here. They were undone by pensions that went overblown by the police and fire departments, much like we're facing here. And really, they're, they're, they're just like us. Now, what we learned from that is that that bankruptcy, just like in Vallejo, just like there will be in thousands of other cities around this country, it's going to happen because we're broke, <laughs> simply. Our state is broke, our nation is broke, our world is broke by these crooked bankers. And the bottom line is that this is going to keep on happening. What we've got to realize is that when the state says they are going to take away our money, our transportation money, this is not a bluff. This is the real deal here because mm -hmm. they're broke. And not only that, but we know, all of us know, that these politicians don't represent us. They re represent the money that puts them into power. So you're goddamn right they're going to find a way to not give us our due money. This is something that's going to happen over and over again. So what I'm saying is that when they say they're going, take, they're going to take away the money, what I'm seeing is a power of unintended consequences hitting us smack in the face. What's that power of unintended consequences? Well, we try to reduce traffic by not making this happen, which is totally understandable because this will bring more cars into Alameda. 
but the power of un unintended consequences says, well, then you lose millions of dollars of your transportation funding. Now, all of a sudden, that small problem becomes a big problem. Imagine losing Fruitvale Bridge. Well, there goes your traffic problem right there, multiplied by 100. Power of unintended consequences, we want to maintain sovereignty of Measure A. Well, what happens then when the state takes over and says you no longer have Measure A? Boom. Now, all of a sudden, you can see multi-housing everywhere. This is going to be a problem Alameda-wide. We talk about trying to keep our way of life. What happens when we go bankrupt? <laughs> our way of life is gone. And we talk about our property values. I fully understand our property values. But what happens when we go bankrupt? Just ask the people of Vallejo what happened to their properties when they went bankrupt. This is the power of unintended consequences that we're facing here. We've got to understand the true reality of what's going on here. We've got to understand this is a small sacrifice to make sure that we get what we need in this new reality. Now, I understand our citizens are, are, are very afraid and very upset about this corruption that's going on from the local to the to world level. I tell you, when he becomes Assembly Speaker, we can speak to him. This is not a fight to pick. Thank you. Thank you. Ger Carol Gottstein and then Karen Lucas. And I just want to say, if there's anybody else in the audience who wants to speak on this topic tonight, please get your speaker slips in now. Carol Gottstein, uh, Alameda resident, third generation. Um, maybe I should preface by saying I'm not against affordable housing. I am against building lots of new housing that never gets filled up. Um, I was here July 3rd, but it was fireworks night. My house is on the parade route, and I had to get back in time to move my car. And I was probably the only one in the audience on my on this side of the argument. I'd like to urge you to vote against accepting this because I, there's no doubt that Andrew Thomas and the planning board bent over backwards. They did everything they possibly could, tried very hard, and passionately, passionately argued their point. But I still don't buy it. I don't like to hear Andrew say, we cannot determine our destiny under state law. And with all due respect to the civics lesson from the city attorney, we're the state. We elect the legislature. It's not something that's divorced from the people. And here in California, this state has a loud and proud tradition of voter revolt, like Proposition 13. Um, I'm not so sure that um, we're comparable to Pleasanton, and I'll tell you why. In fact, every California city needs to be considered on its merits. In the summer of 2009, there were local government transparency hearings held in Sacramento. They were on the Cal Channel. I watched them, and while they were mostly about Bell, a number of city mayors got up and argued that their city was unique. Um, some cities have a zoo. Some cities have a jail. Some cities have a naval base that still works. Um, each city needs to be considered on its own merits. And I think that no matter what lawyers it had, Pleasanton was going to lose. Pleasanton is not surrounded by water. Pleasanton has freeway access. In fact, it's already a transit corridor. 580 and 680 run right through it. Pleasanton has BART. Do you think BART will ever come to Alameda? In 1972, BART opened, and it still doesn't reach San Jose 40 years later. Pleasanton can have lots more roads built to alleviate traffic within it. Pleasanton does not have vintage 1880s to 1920 housing to preserve. It has lots of clean open space and fairgrounds. Um, I just want to say, that I would like to see that crystal ball that the state is looking into to get these RINA predictions. What if the state is wrong about RINA? It was wrong about BART. It's also looking like high-speed rail is a boondoggle. That started out being from San Diego to Sacramento narrowed to LA to SF, now it's barely Bakersfield to Merced, and it's going nowhere. They might just be wrong about 4,000 houses for Alameda. Thank you. Karen Lucas and then Bill Stallman. Karen Lucas, um, I have been on this, I was on this council for three terms, and I was one of the members who had worked hard to uphold Measure A as it is in our city charter, and we have been able to uphold it for a period of 40 years. You are the first council that proposes to undermine it. And I may remind you that there, our housing element has been out of compliance many, many times. It's nothing unusual. Many cities uh, have been 
out of compliance with the housing element, and there has been much litigation in connection with Measure A. Yet previous councils have worked to uphold Measure A. You are, it is your duty to follow our city charter and to uphold Measure A. If you want to change it, put it on the ballot and let us vote on it. You do not have the right to undermine our city charter. Please, we still have more speakers. Bill Stallman and then Raylor Graber. Uh, Bill Stallman, uh, Chestnut Street near the hospital. Um, earlier in the testimony, you um, redirected some questions to Mr. Thomas, and I have a couple myself. The first being um, that talk show radio host Barbara Simpson has had many um, discussions about stack and pack housing and uh, housing element and Agenda 21 and all that stuff. I'm not sure my Rhodesian Ridgeback dog would have a home in any of these places, but um, I would like to know if Corte Madera is the city over there in Marin County where the mayor, like Governor Walker of Wisconsin, said, well, let's, we're not doing this. Uh, next question. I'd like to know if that's the question, because earlier uh, when Mr. Smallman asked, Smallman um, asked, there was mention of Hillsboro, Piedmont, other communities. I didn't see that in the presentation tonight, that some c communities have found, found a way around this. The second point I'd like to ask Mr. Thomas is why all the infill on my block is not counted as multiples um, when the school bond measure was um, on, on the local ballot. The back door was left open to the assessor's database for uh, residents to calculate their square footage and see what their tax would be under measure B or C, whatever that was. And I looked up every address on my street and I believe about um, eight or 12 units aren't even recorded uh, because this, the residents is showed as single family dwellings and they had two or three units in them. Mr. Thomas? Uh, no, uh, we're no, not gonna no, do it that gonna... way. That was a mistake to let that happen to begin yeah. with. If any of the council members want to adopt the questions and ask the staff member, but we're not gonna have direct dialogue. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to the number of speakers and I wanna make sure people get a chance to leave, to excuse me, speak before they have to leave considering the hour. So we will um, have council discussion afterwards and maybe some of your questions will be answered. In other words, I came here tonight and I'm not going to learn what I came to hear. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. I'm trying to get everybody to have an opportunity to come up and speak like you've gotten an opportunity to come up and speak and ask their questions because as the hour gets later, a lot of people can't stay. Did you have a simple answer to the court of Missouri? I'm sorry, could we, could we... Yes. Yeah. Excuse me. Your time is. Do you have you have thirty more seconds, sir? Rayla Graber, and then Jean Fong. Oh, good evening. I have an initial question. Uh, does Alameda have to belong to A Bag? Do we have to belong to A Bag? Okay. Keep keep talking. No. That, I mean that's my question. I'd like an answer. Okay. Okay. Keep talking. All right. I've lived in Alameda over 35 years, so I've grown up with Measure A, and I just returned after a two-month absence to discover that the city is on the fast track to gutting Measure A, our housing charter, which has protected the city since 1973 from overdevelopment and gridlock traffic. The city is doing this in one fell swoop and without giving truly sufficient public notice. No, on something this important, it is not enough to have one or two planning board meetings this year, and as I understand it, one closed city council meeting prior to the July 3rd meeting at which Alamedans were distracted and elsewhere. And if there was such transparency on the part of the city staff, why didn't the city staff tell the local newspapers that you were kind of, that 2,400 units were being contemplated. I'm sure that that would have drawn uh, quite a bit of attention and, and you would have had early involvement uh, from citizens. Uh, yes, prior to July 3rd, why was the only city council meeting on this matter a closed meeting? That's what I understand. I'd like to get into the record that an overall commitment to 2,400 units 
up to five stories high without complete review by both the council and the concerned general public is illegal because Measure A was passed by a vote of the people and substantial alterations of this magnitude should only be made by a vote of the people. I want to get into the record that the building of these units will involve the addition of maybe 6,000 more residents and cars and their needs for transportation, schools, roads, fire, police. And contrary to the ordinance, the portion I read, it does require a new CEQA and environmental impact report because of the met a magnitude of the overall uh, units. If this city wants to build multifamily housing units, and that's fine, and it is a good and necessary plan, then the city should put it to a public vote. It, if it is worthy and necessary, people will vote for it. Anything else is a violation of Measure A and is presumably illegal. Okay, what about a bag? Okay, thank you. I, same okay. same comment. I want to give people who are here an opportunity to ask their questions, and we can have aunt, council. I've been taking notes, and I'm sure staff has been taking notes also. So let's try to get through the speakers, and then we can talk about some of these questions okay. later. Thank, thank you. you. Jean Fong and then Austin Tam. Good evening, Madam Mayor, um, City Council members. Um, I learned a lot today. Um, I want to thank staff for their presentation. I thought that was really good. You know, I'm a 60-plus year resident of this city. I grew up here. I raised my children here. I'm raising my grandchildren here. Um, I share what all of the speakers here share, which is a love of our city. It's a very, very special place. Um, different from any other place, I think, in the country. And so I think it's, um, it's good to know that so many of us are concerned about what happens here. Um, and I know that there, for me, I, you know, when I hear about all of the changes in the development, you know, there's a, there's a sense of fear. I mean, I, I have concern about change and what it's going to do. Is it going to bring traffic? Is it going to change the, special quality of our city. Um, I oppose the theater. I've opposed other things. I think some of you know that. Um, but, you know, some have turned out very well. Some haven't turned out as well. But, you know, I think we have to move forward. So I'm here this evening supporting the proposal of the staff. The one thing that I think that makes me support that is because there's the potential to lose control over the decisions of our city, decisions that make our city special. And I'm not willing to give that up. Thank you. Thank you. Austin Tam and then Michael Yoshi. Dear Mayor and City Council, um, thank you for bringing up this housing element. It's been 15 years long overdue, especially when with, the, with regards to East Housing and the uh, and the evictions that happened in Harbor Island in 2004, and um, it's not—it's really refreshing to see a new, new face, a new direction. Um, and lastly, I urge you to support this housing element. Um, first thing is because um, the cost of um, housing in Alameda, which many young people would like to live, um, live in Alameda, but it is way too expensive. And I think. Um, you know, it's not, it's, I love to, li I'm, I love living in Alameda, but you know, I feel like there's a lot of people in the, in our city that don't want outside people coming in, which we've heard that said a lot of times. And the speaker who said that, um, a lot of opponents, a lot of supporters of this element supported Measure C and Measure, um, in Sun Cow, and I didn't support Sun Cow. Um, and I'm and I'm just urging you to vote um, for this housing element because um, we won't go away until there's um, a, a just housing element. And I thank you for your time. And I'm very excited about this new housing element. Thank you, Michael Yoshi, and then um, former Supervisor Alice Leibicker. Michael Yoshi, pastor of Buena Vista United Methodist Church and uh, resident of Alameda. Um, Madam Mayor and City Council members. Um, I pastor a church in which I see um, 
number of things happening in housing trends. Uh, we have a lot of homeowners, but we also have renters. See people going through foreclosures, issues of crises. Also had the, um, how should I say, the uh, occasion recently to have people camping out at our church. People uh, living, camping there and living because they have nowhere to stay. Had a conversation last Saturday evening, in fact, with people who are camped out outside of our church. Um, I, um, you know, housing um, I think is an important thing for all of us, each and every person in this room. I think we appreciate having a place to live, whether we're renters, whether we're homeowners. Um, I also have two daughters. One is 29, one is 27. Um, my older daughter graduated from Encino High in 2000. My younger daughter graduated from Alameda High in 2003. They're back in the area now after having gone off to college and having some jobs. Fortunately, they're working in this economy. They've got jobs. They just went recently to a homeowner's uh, education project in San Francisco, looking there to get help in terms of finding out their options for, for housing. Back when they were in middle school and high school, was my first uh, opportunity to be engaged in civic discourse around housing issues in Alameda, when maybe a couple of you were on the planning board then, and some of you were not yet in, involved in Alameda politics. Um, and one of the things I have to say about the debate around housing in Alameda is that I think we all care about our city. We all care about this island. I think that's very uh, good of all of us. But one of the things that I don't appreciate is the mean-spiritedness that comes out when we start talking about housing. I just want to call, I just want to call that out for our community uh, around um, the kind of spirit we have when we engage in civic dialogue around these issues. I don't think there's any easy answers to things. When I heard that this housing element was before us now, and uh, there was going to be a meeting tonight to, to approve the housing element that was being proposed, I was thinking to myself, well, what took them so long? You know, it's like back in the late 90s, we were talking about this. We've passed on housing elements. We've been penalized for it. And so for those in the audience here today are saying, well, this is kind of coming too quickly for us, I say, well, wait a minute. This has been far too long. It's about 15 years or so. So what are we going to do? Wait again for another 15 years before we even consider something. I'm been really impressed by the staff's presentation. I learned a lot tonight listening to the presentation, what, what's going to happen and what, what is proposing and what's not proposing. To me, basically, it's proposing housing options. And I, I hear us loud and clearly that we're not approving any housing plans tonight. I'm just as concerned about transportation issues as other people are, but I'm sure in the process, if we have a good, good-spirited conversation in this community, we'll figure it out because we've got resources, we're smart people, and uh, I believe that the process will win out in the end. And uh, if we can work together, um, we'll be the better for it for Alameda. So I support this passage of the housing element. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Alice Light Bitker. Mayor Gilmore, Council Members. I'm Alice Light Bitker. I am uh, happy to be here tonight uh, to support, um, you know, a piece of very difficult work that you're doing. I remember um, before I um, finished my 10 year of service in 2010, we went through the same process, and I voted for the housing element for the Alameda County. And we were many years behind as well. I understand that you're five years behind. And it was also a very difficult conversation. Um, you know, the sentiment is very much the same. And, um, you know, I, I really share what was said by um, um, the person from, from East Bay Housing Element. It's really a lot of those kind of questions asking about, you know, who we are, who we represent, what's the community mean, you know, those kind of things is so important for us to really reflect on. And um, basically, I see what you're doing. You're not mandating, you say encourage and facilitate multi-family housing. And that's what the trend is all over, up and down the state. And um, in the sense that you know, our community has been growing diverse for the last three decades, and um, and we have to recognize there's diverse needs um, in terms of um, housing needs. We need to have options for people, and people have to talk about, you know, teacher salary, um, social workers like I used to be, and and all that are really fit right into um, income that is under affordable 
family. It's not, you know, um, higher end income family. But those people, what they do is so important. My, my own daughter is going to be a teacher. She's still finding job, but you know, her entry level will be 40,000. And um, for a family of two, uh, for a family of three, under 75,000 is considered as the category of moderate income affordable housing. So that is just such a need, and um, I applaud the staff work. I know it's, you know, it's a lot of work. And um, you know, for, the, for Alameda, you have been always been such a uh, strong um, voice from all sorts of community, and I congratulate all the voices. But we do need to uh, work together as we're moving forward, and um, this is to make uh, Alameda progress, not status quo, and um, we look forward to the progress. Thank you. Thank you very much.